Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lucas Gregory. I'm one of the assistant directors at the Texas Water Resources Institute and in College Station at Texas A&M, and we are leading the development of a watershed protection plan for Petronilla and San Fernando Creeks down here uh, that feed into Baffin Bay. Uh, so thank you for coming out to the meeting today to uh, overview several of the chapters of the watershed protection plan that's being developed, and then also to talk about some of the information and the data that's going into the development of the plan. So our goal today is to present the information to you that has been uh, discussed through the working groups that have been uh, completed thus far uh, and then also to get your feedback on this information that the work groups have have reviewed and and basically told us is good to go for the plan um, we obviously have gotten feedback from them but we want to get additional feedback as well so please do uh, listen to what we had to say today uh, speak up and ask questions and all that good stuff uh, and even if you think of something after the fact feel free to email us or call us to talk further about these questions that you may have so the agenda today uh, looks like this. We're gonna start out with an overview of the first three chapters of the Watershed Protection Plan. Uh, myself and Mr. Ennis Rios, uh, also from the Water Resources Institute, will uh, do the talking on this section. Um, we will also present some of the uh, population information that goes into the next steps of the Watershed Plan development, uh, just to make sure that y'all are okay with those numbers uh, that the working groups have, have pushed out as well. Um, from there, we will switch over to a presentation from Mr. Brian Koch with the State Swan Water Conservation Board. Uh, he'll be talking about the water quality management planning process that they do uh, and the development of those, those plans and all the steps that it involves. Uh, and then we'll wrap up the day with um, an overview of the management recommendations that have come out of those working groups uh, and also an overview of the load reduction estimates uh, that we have developed uh, based on the available information, uh, water quality and flow related for the watershed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rios to take uh, the first steps in presenting the watershed plan chapters. Howdy, everyone. Uh, as Lucas kindly introduced, uh, my name is Ennis Rios. I work with him and Claire over at the Texas Water Resource Institute. Um, what we're looking at here is, is just a map of the watershed. Uh, you know, for all the stakeholders that kind of live in all the different towns and, and rural areas, um, you, know, you might not have a, an idea of just exactly how big the watershed is that we're, we're talking about. But here it is. Uh, you know, you can see it, it kind of expands all the way up there uh, from almost free air, uh, got Orange Grove on the northern side and down to Kingsville. Um, and, and then of course, all the way down to Baffin Bay where the, uh, the, the bodies of water uh, drain into. So um, we've got San Fernando is on the west side and then Petronella is on the east side. Uh, the, the red lines, uh, that are kind of in conjunction with the, the blue lines. You can kind of tell those are streams. Uh, the red portions indicating that those are the impaired segments of the water bodies that we are uh, concerned about. <clears throat> the, uh, the green dots on this, uh, just like the legend says, there are the primary surface, uh, surface water quality monitoring stations. Uh, we end up only using two at the end of this. Uh, you, you'll kind of have that explained um, as, as far as why we chose those two to kind of uh, be representative of the watershed. But there are four uh, water quality monitoring stations and uh, that, uh, that those are the locations there, as you can see. So the first thing we're gonna get into is um, kind of an introduction to watershed management. What What is it in general? Uh, how do we approach it? What What kinds of things go into it and how it works? So a watershed protection plan in general is, is just this. Uh, it's, it's a holistic stakeholder-driven plan, meaning that rather than having outside entities come in and kind of dictate what kind of management practices uh, people or municipalities need to do, it's kind of a let's get together, let's figure out what you think is feasible. Uh, we can bring the, the science, the information, and some of the professionals that have been working in the water industry, um, you know, that have experience with this uh, to present ideas that maybe worked in the past or that may work best based on science and experience. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a you know, an in inclusive project where uh, y'all are getting 
together, coming up with ideas. We're presenting ideas. And then at the end of the day, we move forward with something that everybody agrees on. So uh, it's, it's kind of made to be uh, a very interactive process um, so that we, we get something that not only will work based on uh, science or experience, but will work based on uh, people wanting to do the things that we're, we're talking about implementing here. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a voluntary thing. It's not uh, like mandates that come down or something like that. It's, it's uh, people working together to come up with a plan. So in watershed protection plans, uh, these are some things that basically, if these things are included, it, the, the, plan, the plan is most likely to be successful. Uh, these are the, the nine elements that have been identified. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're a bit intuitive. Uh, of course, you want to identify what the problems are. You want to come up with some ideas uh, as far as how to reduce, um, you know, the contamination maybe to the water bodies uh, and uh, come up with uh, implementation strategies, basically, you know, how to, how to get things moving in the right direction. You want to come up with uh, benchmarks, you know, something that's measurable, like, you know, a year from now, we want to be at this point or have this much reduction going on. And you you want to you want to know where the funding is coming from, <clears throat> so that's also included in the plan. Uh, you know who's who's foot, footing the bill for this portion, who can help with this portion, uh, how's it all going to come together, and uh, can can we afford the plan that we're we're putting in place? Uh, and, and if not, where can we go find some more funding to include? Um, and then of course you want to monitor the effectiveness of the plan. That's that's the last kind of measure that's included here. <clears throat> That's important because um, the the watershed. I mean, it's an expansive piece of piece of land that covers four counties, a bunch of different kinds of land cover. Uh, you you want to make sure basically that as as the landscape changes, as things happen within the watershed, um, you know, torrential downpours or you have a big land use land cover change that happens, uh, the plan might need to be modified a little bit. So that's kind of where we get in. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's where we get into this next slide here. Adaptive management, it's just that, just what I said. Uh, you know, as, as things happen in the watershed, uh, it's not like a hard and fast, well, this, these, are the, these are the limits that we set, these are the implementations that we, we put in place. It, there's no going back. Well, that's not the case. Um, it's, it's adaptive. We can reassess based on its uh, effectiveness or ineffectiveness here and there, uh, and then make adjustments as needed. The other thing that's important on this slide and that's important in any watershed protection plan uh, to be successful is the education and outreach. Uh, you know, it, it's one thing for all of us to get together and talk about the, the plans and strategies that we want to set forward uh, and, and, and move forward with. But if we're not educating the public as to what we're trying to do and how they can be involved and how they can help and how their actions affect uh, the success or lack of uh, success of the water plan, in, you know, then, then we're not doing as much as we could. So education is a part of it. Um, you know, we, we try to schedule education outreach events uh, once we kind of get the, get the things up and rolling uh, to let people know, you know, what we're doing and how they can help, how they can be involved, or, or how they can change their behaviors, modify their behaviors to uh, contribute to the success of the watershed plan. Next thing we're going to get into uh, is the watershed characterization. So this is just kind of another looking at a bunch of different facets of the watershed. Um, you know, land use, land cover, precipitation, soils. Um, what 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 are we looking at here? You know, like what is the watershed made up of? Um, so let's get into that. Again, this is just kind of an overview. Remind us where we're looking at. You know, these are the boundaries of the watershed. Um, San Fernando on the west side, Petronilla on the east side. Um, in, in total, we're kind of referring to it as the Baffin Bay watershed. Um, and that just kind of includes both areas that we're looking at here. So the first thing we look at uh, here are the hydrologic soil groups. And the soil groups, basically the, the classifications that we're looking at here, there are a lot of different ways to classify soil. This one being hydrologic, uh, we're talking about the ability for the soils to um, uh, take water in uh, or 
how likely the soils are to have runoff. Basically, like the, the water cannot infiltrate them very well. So any water that falls on them is likely to just run off. Well, A, uh, category A has the least amount of runoff. Category D has the most amount of runoff. So you can see we're mostly we're dealing with um, fairly high runoff potentials, uh, except for, of course, up in the northwestern part there. Um, there's a, a, a pretty sharp line there you'll see along the county lines, uh, and, and that's just because the soil surveys are done at different times by different people, and it's really up to the person on the ground doing the survey to categorize the soil as one hydrologic group or the other. So clearly there was a difference of opinions there, uh, but it's still a good uh, a good map just to kind of get an idea of, of what we're looking at. Um, mostly medium potential for runoff uh, and then a high potential for runoff there in the central area. Next thing we look at here is land use, land cover. Uh, cultivated crops basically dominate the eastern side of the watershed. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that makes sense based on driving around and kind of seeing what's going on there. Uh, the center has hay and pasture is kind of the dominant area or dominant land use. And then uh, out west is shrub and scrub. So I think if you, if you live in this area, you've driven around the area, uh, this makes fairly good sense. Um, of course, there are the uh, developed, uh, developed areas around the cities. Uh, so the reason looking at something like this is kind of important is that it, it kind of helps us shape our ideas or, or when we're coming up with ideas of strategies to, to improve the water quality of those uh, impaired segments, you want to see what kind of stuff we're looking at that's around them. Like what is, what's affecting those segments? Uh, are we looking at runoff from, um, from crops? Uh, are we looking at like too much nitrogen getting in there from fertilizer runoff? Uh, or are we talking about near the cities where you've got a high potential for some of the maybe wastewater treatment plants or sewage stuff, uh, malfunctioning, overflowing, cracking, uh, things breaking down just from age? Uh, you know, are, are you going to have to mitigate for, for that or the other or a combination of both in some areas? So that's kind of why we look at these maps to get an idea. Like you're not going to implement something way out in the western part. Uh, the same as you would in the city of Kingsville. Uh, they're, they're probably going to have different strategies, different approaches there to try to improve the water quality. This is just an overview of the precipitation. Um, this is over the past 10 years, the annual precipitation for each month. Uh, the temperature is also included down there in the, in the chart in the bottom right. So basically you can see out west, uh, there's less rain than out east. Um, it's just kind of a map to, to get an idea of, you know, wh where's the heavier precipitation, where's the lighter precipitation. Uh, if there's heavier precipitation or more often heavier precipitation, like we might expect more runoff in those areas. Uh, so a lot of like uh, non-point pollution um, might, might occur in that area more than it would in the uh, lower precipitation areas. Um, and then the, I, I think the, Temperature, temperature, and uh, precipitation down there is pretty self-explanatory. The the red bars are the daily max temps. We we can see you know August being the highest temperatures on average over the past 10 years. May having the most rainfall over the past 10 years. But as we know and as we've seen in recent history with the crazy weather, uh, these aren't necessarily you know like hard and fast. There there are plenty of high and low temperature events and high and low rain events that, that occur uh, outside of, of what we see here. So this is the population data, um, people population, as opposed to some of the animal population that we'll get into later on in the presentation. Um, this again is kind of important just because uh, when you're trying to develop your protection plan, usually where there's a higher population, that's a different kind of uh, mitigation that you're going to have to do there than, you know, out in the rural areas where uh, not a lot of people are. Uh, where there's a lot of people, we've got um, pet and, you know, pet and animal waste. Uh, you've got city sewage, uh, wastewater treatment plants. Um, there, there are kind of different challenges that you face in the highly populated areas as opposed to the rural areas. So 
this again just kind of helps identify those areas. So switching gears a little bit, we're going to talk about the existing water quality in Petronilla and San Fernando Creeks. Uh, and this is data that's available from TCEQ uh, through their Surface Water Quality Management Information System and is information that's collected by the Nueces River Authority and the TCEQ Regional Office. Uh, and we're basically just showing you this information to give you a picture of where water quality is uh, in these creeks today uh, and back in the past. So we'll be looking at uh, specific concentrations and trends over time uh, and things of that nature uh, during this discussion. So again, here's just the watershed map. Uh, this map does highlight the different assessment units within the two water bodies. So San Fernando Creek there on the bottom and the left only has one assessment unit. So it actually makes it very easy to, to look at the data from this water body. Uh, Petronella Creek on the other hand has a number of different assessment units. So the, uh, I guess the dark purple one down there at the bottom right corner, that's actually a tidal segment. So that's tidally influenced. It has a different uh, water quality parameters, water quality indicators and water quality standards than the upstream segments do. Uh, so we'll be focusing uh, on uh, both the tidal and the non-tidal segments with this water quality data. Okay, so just a little bit of a, a review on the water quality standards. So the impairments that exist on Petronella and San Fernando Creek are for primary contact recreation. And to evaluate primary contact recreation, the state evaluates uh, bacteria concentrations in water bodies. So for freshwater, uh, this is the upstream portion of Petronella, so above that tidal segment, uh, and then the entirety of San Fernando Creek, E. coli, is the indicator bacteria. Uh, and the water quality standard is 126 colonies of bacteria per 100 milliliters of water. So that's about four ounces of water. Um, so not a whole lot. Uh, in those tidal waters, so where they're, they're brackish, they are, are influenced by the, the tides and have that saltwater influence, enterococcus is the bacteria that is used to evaluate uh, that primary contact standard. So the standard for that is 35 colonies of bacteria per that same 100 milliliters or four ounces. Uh, and really, the, these are fecal indicator bacteria. Uh, they are known uh, members of the gut of everything with hair, fur, and feathers uh, that's out there. So they're known to be associated with fecal uh, contamination. And obviously the risk of uh, humans that are using that water body to contract some sort of a, an illness uh, from those organisms uh, is, is indicated by these numbers. Um, just because they're there doesn't mean that the water quality is bad or anything, but the higher those concentrations, the higher the level of risk of some of the fun things that you don't want to contract uh, being in that water actually is. So moving down to the screening levels, so the state actually does not have water quality standards for nutrients uh, or chlorophyll A even. They do have established screening levels, and this basically is the 85th percentile of water quality data for that parameter statewide uh, in like water bodies. So essentially, if the water quality is above a screening level that's established, it's saying, okay, water quality here is at least worse than 85% of the water bodies that are out there. Um, and again, this is a, just a screening level. The standards have not been established yet, but the state is in the process of developing those standards. So the one that we'll actually present is chlorophyll A. Uh, and this is basically a measure of chlorophyll in the water, which is produced by plants. So in this case, it's algae uh, that's present in the water. Obviously, algae or, or all plant life uh, requires nutrition to grow. And usually, water bodies are nutrient limited. So if they're in a, a normal state or even a deficient state, uh, those chlorophyll A levels are going to be super low. But if you have uh, an influx of nu nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, things of that nature that plants require, uh, it can claw, cause a bloom uh, in, in algae life and an increase in that chlorophyll A value. So this is a surrogate for reporting uh, or evaluating nutrient loads in those water bodies. And uh, there are screening level concerns for chlorophyll A in both Petronella and San Fernando Creek. So I'll be showing data for both of these, uh, the contact recreation and the screening level for chlorophyll A uh, here momentarily. 
So starting off, we're going to look at the Petronella Creek Tidal segment. So this is the one closest to the bay. Uh, and this is the E. coli, I'm sorry, the Enterococcus uh, concentrations for uh, that segment of the water body. So you notice that two different stations um, have been used uh, in this situation. So those assessment units cover uh, miles and miles of, of creek in a number of uh, cases and they may have more than one station. So in this case, there's actually two stations that have available data, uh, enterococcus data. Uh, so we integrated that together and, and used it to uh, basically create a rolling geometric mean. That's essentially a fancy average uh, that kind of buffers those extremely high values. Uh, because if you just did a standard average, the uh, one high value would really pull that, that average value up. And, and make it exceed that standard much, much faster. Uh, so the geometric mean is the state's um, preferred or chosen metric uh, for evaluating water quality uh, and looking at trends over time. So the dashed line, dashed blue dots here at the bottom of the graphic are the geometric mean standard uh, or criterion, and that's that 35 colonies of bacteria per 100 milliliters of water. So theoretically what we would like to see is most of these black uh, dots, those are the individual data points. You would want to see the majority of those below that line. Uh, that would, in, of course, indicate that water quality is generally pretty good, uh, and that would generally mean that that average is going to stay below or within that water quality standard. Um, in this case, uh, you can see that it's kind of a scattering, and there are a number of really high values. So there's some that are in the uh, six to 700 range, which is about uh, nearing 20 times higher than that water quality standard. So having a, a one event every now and then at that level is not problematic. Uh, those are often associated with storm events. Uh, storms naturally flush the, the, the watershed system and transport a lot of contaminants in from the watershed, um, which includes fecal matter of all those things with hair, fur, and feathers that are out there. Uh, and it also stirs up a lot of sediment and, and uh, just creates a lot of disturbance in the water body. Again, that's a natural process, so not necessarily bad, but if that uh, occurs often enough, then it's certainly going to uh, create some uh, averages that are higher than the norm, I guess you might say. So in this case, um, you can see that red line, that's the seven-year rolling geometric mean uh, for that E. coli average, and it certainly uh, is above the uh, allowable limit in most cases. So back here in 2005, 2006, it looks like it dipped down below that for a period of time, but since then it's been uh, markedly above uh, that water quality standard. And if I remember correctly, the current or the most recent assessment showed that the geometric mean was about 51 or 52, I think. So not terribly high above uh, that water quality standard. So moving upstream uh, into the non-tidal segment, this gets into fresh water. So again, the E. coli is the bacteria of choice uh, in these freshwater bodies. Um, and you can see that the, the scale is obviously a little bit different, but again, we're looking at, at different organisms here. So um, that E. coli concentration is 126, and that's again represented by the dosh, or da, dotted uh, blue line there at, towards the bottom of the graphic. You notice the scale on the y-axis here. There get to be some really high numbers, and you can see a couple of data points, um, both in the, the lower assessment unit and the upper assessment unit that are at the 24,000 mark. So those are both really high values for E. coli, uh, and those are both uh, associated with storm events, uh, which again, it's a natural process where obviously a lot of things are, are being washed into the stream that maybe aren't there on a normal basis. Uh, but those values are real numbers, and, and they certainly can have an influence on uh, that average water quality. Um, so again, looking at the red line, that's the average over time. You can see that that is above that dashed line or dotted line there and is generally moving in an upward trend, which is not what we would like to see. Uh, so this essentially points to the fact that there are um, impairments uh, in the water body and that there is a need to basically address that nutrient loading, I'm sorry, the E. coli loading uh, into these water bodies. 
Um, moving down to San Fernando Creek, uh, somewhat similar of a story. Uh, again, this is looking at E. coli um, and, and looking at that over time. Uh, so uh, as mentioned earlier, there's only the one uh, station on San Fernando Creek. So we're only looking at data from that one location there right around Kingsville. Um, you will notice a difference in the y-axis between here and Petronilla. Uh, this one only goes up to 2,500. So these high values are actually 2,400 uh, colonies of E. coli per 100 milliliters. So not near as high. Um, they certainly could have been higher, but that was the limit of the test that was done on those specific days. Um, nonetheless, the point being in this whole graphic is that, again, that seven-year rolling average is well above that uh, allowable standard of 126. So over the past probably three to four years, though, uh, that trend has been in a general downward uh, direction, which is good, uh, but it's still fairly well above that water quality standard. So again, still indicative of, of work to be done uh, in this water body as well. So this is a, a graph or a slide that shows graphics for all four of the assessment units, and this is all chlorophyll A. Um, again, that uh, screening level is 14.1 micrograms per liter. So just looking at the y-axis on these um, four graphics, you can see that those values are generally well above that 14.1. Um, so in this case, the y-axis goes up to 1,500. So that's a over a hundredfold increase. Um, on what that screening level is. So obviously not all the samples are up there, but we did have one over here a couple of years ago that's really, really elevated. Um, and it looks like uh, every site had something similar, uh, maybe with the exception of the tidal segment of Petronilla. Uh, but it also could have indicated that a, a sample was not collected that day uh, for that location as well. But nonetheless, again, the, the averages and the trends are uh, staying well above that screening level uh, for the vast majority of time. Uh, and it does indicate uh, a nutrition uh, loading issue uh, across the watershed. So that indicates that there is some need to address the nutrient loads that are coming into the water body. Um, and these can come from both the non-point source uh, non-point sources that are out there uh, in the landscape uh, and even down to the point sources that are direct discharges into the water body. So it can certainly be any and all of those. Howdy again. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about watershed population estimates. Uh, this time we are talking about animals, not people. So first we're going to look at the cattle, cattle population estimates. Uh, again, these are just estimates. The um, National Agricultural Statistical Survey um, publishes some numbers, and we kind of took that and distributed it over the appropriate land, land cover where uh, cattle might actually be found as opposed to, you know, within the city limits, uh, although on occasion. Uh, but uh, these are the best estimated numbers that we came up with um, based on some feedback from, from y'all in the watershed, uh, you know, kind of saying, hey, I think that's a little high here, a little low there. So uh, they're, they're adjusted somewhat. Uh, so there are the numbers for Petronilla, you can see uh, about 8,600 in San Fernando, uh, just under 30,000 head. So a total of 38,000 uh, overall. And <clears throat> the reason that, you know, we're, we're counting livestock based on a watershed protection plan or for a watershed protection plan is that um, obviously their excrement, uh, when you've got rain events or direct deposition into uh, the creeks uh, that they're living near or on, um, it, it affects the, the water quality, the, wa the water health within the uh, segments that we're looking at. So that's why we try to get a good estimate of the, the animals that are living in the area and their contributions uh, to the health of the watershed. So uh, if anybody's got any feedback on these numbers, uh, you know, please shoot an email to myself, Claire, or Lucas, and, and we can definitely make adjustments and, and take a look at that. Other livestock in the area other than cattle, we looked at horse, goat, and sheep, and these are the numbers there. Um, again, this is based on that NAS data from 2017, and that data comes out every couple of years. Um, it, it takes a minute for it to get certified uh, as being accurate, but these are the 2017 numbers. So, again, th these numbers, I mean, if they're if they're plus or minus uh, one or two hundred, even, uh, you know, it's uh, Hey, we'll be okay as far as estimating uh, what we need to do for uh, load reductions in the watershed. Uh, but so long as they're not 
crazy off, uh, then then we should be good. But again, if anybody has feedback, uh, feel free to shoot us shoot us emails uh, with that information. Okay, another important thing to look at in the watershed <clears throat> that can have a great impact on the, the health or lack of health of the water bodies are uh, on-site sewage facilities. So this map kind of outlines where we estimate there are on-site sewage facilities. <clears throat> uh, this is basically done using uh, 911 address points. So kind of the same, the same database that they use for like reverse 911, uh, you know, to send out emergency notifications and messages. Well, uh, there's an ad address associated with each of those numbers. So you kind of take those, look at where they're at, go into the map and kind of adjust, you know, like, well, that's probably not actually a real address or there's nothing actually on that piece of land. Uh, and, and then you kind of extrapolate some information from there. So it, it's just an estimate of where we think uh, the sewage facilities are, um, but it's the best information we have. So this, this is what we use. Um, there are about 9,000 OSSFs. Uh, in the area, and again, these are these are good to to know because the way that they might contribute contaminants is if they aren't if they aren't well maintained for whatever reason they're they're abandoned. Um, it, it's costly to keep them up to date and within code or to repair them, uh, or if there's a flood event or something happens where they're discharged or um, you know contributing uh, contaminants directly into the soils, which are then carried into the the bodies of water that we're looking at. Uh, it's just good to know where all these are at within the watershed. This map, what it does, <clears throat> it kind of looks at, you know, where we think all those uh, on-site sewage facilities are. Uh, here are the, the areas that are the most dense, and they, they have the most density of uh, OSSFs on site. So uh, what else is outlined in this one or highlighted in the green and kind of purple dots there? Our proximity to uh, creeks. So we've got within 50 yards identified and within 100 yards identified. And again, it you know to know where those are <clears throat> doesn't mean that those are the 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 ones that are most likely to contribute to contamination into the water bodies. But it's good to know that they're there because should anything happen to those particular OSSFs, yeah, they are most likely to be. <clears throat> uh, directly contributing to the uh, the health or, or lack of uh, in, in the water bodies. So we kind of identify those there. This again is looking at OSSFs, but this time in relation to uh, FEMA flood zones. <clears throat> again, the, the flood zones here you can kind of see are, uh, they're a little weird along the county lines because they're done at different times by different people. But in general, it gives you a good idea of uh, where they are in relation to flood zones. And again, that's important because if you have a flooding event and if there's anything wrong with those OSSFs, you know, while if, if an OSSF is, is cracked or leaking or broken or something and there's no flooding, it might just be affecting that area, you know, that person's property, maybe some groundwater, but it, it might be localized. But as soon as you bring a flooding event in there, it's carrying all that stuff directly into uh, the water bodies that we're, we're trying to improve. So this is, uh, this kind of helps visualize that. Dogs and cats, a lot of us have them. Uh, this dog and cat estimates, uh, <clears throat> just more creatures in the watershed that could be contributing to the overall health. So 
Uh, this is an estimate based on the American Veterinary Medical Association, 2017, 2018. Uh, just, you know, on average across America, there are X numbers of cats, X numbers of dogs uh, in each household. This is, this is an estimate. So then you look at how many households we have in each of the counties that we're looking at, and then come, you know, apply that number, come up with a total for each uh, cats and dogs. There are quite a few. Um, you know, that's not to say every household has them or, or does not, but uh, these are the estimates. So uh, these are good to know because, <clears throat> you know, well, cats, I don't know. Uh, but dogs in particular, when we're talking about like uh, city parks, waste stations, um, putting in those kind of implementations to help improve the water quality, um, you, you kind of want to know how many animals you're looking at. So you can, you can say, hey, there are quite a few uh, dog owners estimated in this area, uh, not a lot of pet stations. If we put in pet stations, could it improve the water quality by a certain percentage? We would like to get funding for that. So, um, you know, it, it seems silly to kind of quantify how many dogs and cats are in the, in the area. Uh, but when you're trying to make a case for, for funding and for things to implement to improve the water quality, it, it all helps. The, the bigger case you've got, the, the better you are, the, the more likely you are to get, get things done uh, related to that. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> the last thing we're going to look at here are the uh, wastewater treatment plants. You know, kind of like the OFSS, um, if, if something's wrong, it, it might only be affecting uh, the local local area that, you know, the local site that that thing is located on. Uh, but in reality, with these wastewater treatment plants, uh, a lot of them have discharges that are um, either in a roundabout way or directly into uh, the water body of concern that we're looking at. So, uh, you know, again, it's, it's not that the wastewater treatment plants are like, well, they're the focal point because they're the ones. It, it's not that, but they do have a high potential that if something goes wrong, um, it can be really bad really quick. So uh, this just kind of shows where they are in the area, how many we're looking at. Um, and, you know, uh, out to the left there are uh, quarters in noncompliance. Uh, quarters in noncompliance could be anything. It could be like a reporting issue, but it could also be, you know, they were uh, they had too high of content of E. coli or something in the water body. So uh, this is just good for situational awareness, you know, here they are. It, here are the quarters of noncompliance, and for what? Uh, what can we do uh, as as watershed protection planners uh, to maybe address and try to help out some of those uh, treatment plants um, that that might be underfunded or might need uh, refurbishing or might need random things done to to help improve. So this is where they're at. Um, that that is that is it for our presentation today. Uh, if anybody has any questions or feedback, which is always welcome, uh, these are the email addresses. Um, you can feel free to email any one of us, and we'll make sure to get that information distributed and uh, take it all into account. So uh, thank you all for uh, for attending. <clears throat>